What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we're going to be reviewing Connor Rogers Mock Draft 2.0. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, subscribe to that fun YouTube jazz. Below my face is my board. Below that is going to be a beautiful ticker of all the ways you can stay connected as well as take advantage of the limited opportunities that you get exclusively for watching this video and the show. Links are also in the description below. Let's get right into this. Let's have a lot of fun. Connor Rogers is someone who I have a lot of respect for, someone who I look up to. So who knows? Maybe one day when we get large enough, we can get Connor Rogers on the show because, you know, him, Trevor, all those guys there uh, formerly or currently at PFF obviously are the main target for us to be able to hang out with and be able to enjoy some content on the show with. But for the time being, their mock drafts and their professional work that they get paid for is going to be what is good. So uh, let's get right into this. Connor, uh, sorry to pause it on an awkward moment of your face, but it's what it is. Start off with the Bears. This is before Thursday Night Football. Got to clarify that as well. But again, feel free to read up on all this stuff right here. Bears go Caleb Williams. So for me, uh, it, again, the Bears most likely will be having another pick in the top five. I'm not going to go completely against the idea of going after a quarterback, again, it's the most valuable position. The Bears have a lot of talent elsewhere as well. For me, I would consider going after wide receiver Marvin Harrison at this point, but it's a very deep wide receiver class. It's not very deep, not in terms of Marvin Harrison Jr. style, but the Chicago Bears technically do have their true wide receiver one already on roster. You don't necessarily need to push that narrative. Uh, while Justin Fields, I still would be willing to give him some time and some development. Uh, this is probably the smarter move. It's probably the better return on investment. Now, does that mean it's the right move overall? That's up for debate. But if you have two top five picks, spending one of them on a quarterback position when you don't have a guaranteed quarterback is probably a smart idea. So I got to play a little bit of devil's advocate there because I haven't gone Caleb Williams. I haven't gone quarterback for the Bears in a hot minute, but still well worth the idea. And um, I would definitely not be against it if it were to happen. You have the Giants going Drake May. Of course, I'm in full support of this. Y'all know. I mean, I do everything I can to get the Giants Drake May or Caleb Williams, luckily, or maybe un. Fortunately, one of the two, depending on uh, whether you're looking forward to the draft or having to watch them right now, uh, the Giants are in a position where you can get at least one of those two. I Obviously, it's another team where they have a lot of pieces and you know this could be maybe not the final piece, but one of the final pieces and they have a lot of draft capital and that's a very good thing when you're this high up in the draft and you have that draft capital. Uh, number three, the New England Patriots go Olu Fashanu. A uh, tackle is obviously a very smart move for the Patriots. I would probably, again, I don't know where, uh, this is a live reaction to, just to clarify, I don't know where all the tackles are going to land, but maybe I'd feel a little more comfortable going after a super unique player like Marvin Harrison Jr. here because they have yet to get the wide receiver position right. And I trust Bill to draft offensive linemen a little bit better. So, for me, I would be willing to bet my chips on pushing a tackle to round two than going here. But it, obviously, this is one of the best picks. It's easily a top three pick for me at New England spot here. So, you know, I obviously want to go after a quarterback if one's available. One is not. So this is still an excellent selection. Uh, pick number four, the Cardinals go Marvin Harrison Jr. I don't feel like I need to explain much here. He is one of my blue chip players. Actually, no, he's not even my blue chip. He's in my generational category. You just don't get to see one of these guys every five years. So for me, that is technically what generational means. I essentially mean for the first contract phase of, you know, I just, I don't know. I feel like five to 10 years is a good idea for the idea of generational based on the way that contracts are structured for first rounders. But regardless, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., great addition. Kyler Murray would be perfectly happy with it. And plus, Kyler Murray is not a bad quarterback. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Bears then go Malik Neighbors. Obviously, I'm a, I'm actually a, quite a big fan of Malik Neighbors. He overall as a receiver doesn't, he's not holistically an amazing receiver in terms of the route running ability and just you know he's essentially amazing on a limited number of routes. He has unbelievable athleticism and he's great after the catch. 
in 95% of systems that have their route runner style of dude who will get separation through his um, overall route running ability, he's going to be probably the best guy you can try to draft after Marvin Harrison Jr. Unless you want to get Keon Coleman in that aggressive contested catch type of guy. So I'm not going to disagree with Malik Neighbors being a great fit on the Bears. I would just say I would prefer to just kick Justin Fields down the or like that whole entire quarterback debate down the line and get Marvin Harrison Jr. Again, the quarterback position is far more valuable, but I'm not sold on Malik Neighbors being this good. But again, I'm not going to shame the Bears going after wide receiver. I do think they need it. And I think he'd be a good addition. And I think Caleb Williams would love him. I don't feel like, I feel like this is very similar to how I felt, how I felt about the Seattle draft. It's like, for me, I don't always believe it hits the exact notes that I'm really looking for, but it's still going to work out and it's going to work out really well. So I think it will be a, if it ends up happening that way, I think that it'll end up pretty damn well. But, you know, I, I just have those deep desires for the Bears to go Marvin Harrison Jr., or, I mean, at this pick, maybe Joe Alt instead, you know, like rather than Malik Neighbors. It's the Malik Neighbors of it all that makes me be like, damn, if you wanted wide receiver that badly, just go after the generational talent. Regardless, at number six, the Packers go Joe Alt. I think it's a great move. I make the move myself. I know that Packers fans aren't 100% in agreement with going tackle in the first, but, you know, tackles, left tackle especially is a huge, huge thing for your team. And, uh, you know, not having Bakhtiari probably for the future. You have him for one more year, but that's barring a trade as well. Uh, it just It's your best return on investment at pick number six. Pick number seven, the Rams go Marius Mims. I've been considering him as returning in my mock drafts just because of the fact that, you know, he is so young, with so limited experience. He's been hurt, but this dude is an absolute baller. So I can't really complain. Again, I have him. Where is he at on my board? Um, I have him at 22 right now with the injuries. He was top 15 without. I would not blame the Rams if he ends up coming out and, you know, the talent is obviously worth a top 10 pick. I don't blame him. I don't. And this is a team that has time to develop him. So I, I do like that pick quite a bit. Tennessee Titans go Brock Bowers. You know, I've been trying to hold out as much as I can on Chickaconquo. I obviously love Josh Wiley with all my heart. So a little bit biased when saying maybe Brock Bowers isn't the guy that the Titans need. But Jesus, when you can get someone who's generational, I keep saying this, it doesn't always matter if you have a tight end that is serviceable. When you can get someone who's generational and something that no other team's probably going to have besides you, unless you know, you're know you seeing the Hall of Fame like franchise tight ends, you go after it. And Brock Bowers is one of those guys. So I would not blame the Titans. Worst case scenario, or I guess maybe it's the best case scenario where, you know, Chig ends up continuing to ascend. Uh, you can end up putting Brock as a wide receiver and you'll be perfectly fine. And he's an elite blocker too. I love it. I mean, I really do like that pick. Uh, Denver Broncos going lay out to law two. I'm still not sold on law two. I know it sounds insane. The statistics, his size, the measurables and immeasurables are pretty much off the charts. And I'm trying so hard to really appreciate law two for what he is uh, i'm not sold on him yet being a legitimate first rounder and that sounds insane i know but it also factors in the amount of dudes who are in this class i mean i'm watching his games versus jordan morgan for example i uh, wanted to watch that one pretty heavily the majority of his pressure came off of tight ends like to me i'm i'm just not a huge fan of when you know you're i don't know i don't know Regardless, under the common eye of what Leotu Latu is, this is a great pick for the Broncos. They do need to continue boosting that edge room. Granted, they wouldn't have gotten rid of their guys if they did they did not believe in their edge core, but you know, Latu, especially given the public perception of him, would be an upgrade. I would go corner just because I think corner's a lot more limited in this class. And if you wanted to go after edge, you know, there are dudes down the board I like a little bit more than the corner class. Uh, Falcons going chop, going back to Penn State for another edge rusher. I think chop could be a top 10 edge rusher in the NFL if he's in the right situation. So he's heavily a post draft evaluation for me. But, uh, you know, the talents there. I don't know if the Falcons have the mentorship in terms of the I mean, Clay Campbell, if he's there, could be someone who could be a catalyst for success. But I don't know if this is the place that would be my dream spot for him. 
I love Braylon Trice to the Falcons as well, so I'm a little bit biased in that regard for him to be that 270-pound frame to fit where Bud Dupree is right now. But still, I mean, Chop Robinson, you're taking a swing on somebody who could be legitimately a top 10 edge rusher in the NFL. I'm not going to fault the Falcons. Just deep down inside, I'd wish for him to go to a different location. Uh, you got the commanders going to Lise Fawaga. Glad to see Talise still get in love. Obviously, he let up four pressures versus Colorado. That does disturb me. I watched that game, and you know it was very similar to the pressures he let up to Taylor Upshaw in Arizona the week before. I want to see him continue to learn, and maybe back-to-back weeks of consistent failure of the same aspect is enough of a kick in the ass to get him back on track, and I hope that's the case. I really do, because y'all know I've loved Talise from the beginning. He was my... OT2 coming into the year like I was like all right I'm gonna put my balls on the table let's see what happens and most of the time it fails you know like Jalen Jones even though he's starting for the Colts like he was my number two corner at one time and you know just as much as I had success I also have failure uh Talise was one of my successes and I mean I'm even saying caution I dropped him out of my generational tier because of the fact that I see that he he needs more development than I initially thought. I thought he already progressed, and he's progressed so much for how, like, over year over year, he's progressed exponentially. And still trying to get him to come on the show, because I do have a buddy on Oregon State. Just trying my best. Trying my best. But the commanders can definitely use the offensive tackle help. Uh, Buccaneers going Jared Verse. You know, for me, I don't feel like this is a bad move at all. I have a very high opinion of some of the quarterbacks in this class pretty apparently you'll see it right there um like i have three in the top 15 let's just call it 15 and you know that is incredible they'll continue to climb that's the thing i'm waiting for a little bit more all 22 before i boost them up like it is not fully representative of my exact thoughts on them but to be fair i don't think they're blue chip players just yet drake may might be drake may might be a blue chip player kind of sounds insane because he is in the conversation with caleb williams but the topic for another day. Uh, but, you know, I feel like I love Bo Nix and Michael Penix for this roster. For me, that would be the way I'd go. I'm not going to shame him if they go Jared Verse because Jared Verse is a great player. I have that number nine on my board. Not going to shame a team to go after a high value position with a high value player. It's a good pick. Uh, Jets going Keon Coleman. That'd be such a good combination with Garrett Wilson. If he's on the board, I think it's smart to take him. Now, I would say maybe J.C. Latham to be the offensive line side of things because I sense Aaron Rodgers would be better with better protection than better weapons. But, you know, it is what it is. I don't think they're going to be complaining too much about having a superstar like Keon Coleman that I've just moved into my blue chip tier. You got the Chargers going Kool-Aid McKinstry, uh, number one corner on the board. And I totally agree with this. He would be across from Asante Samuel. Um... I think it's Michael Davis who's up for a contract right now, but whoever the boundary corner number two is, is up for a contract. So, and he hasn't even been performing that well this year. So Cooley McKinstry has a legitimate role that is going to be a big vacancy and it's one that he can improve. So this could be a major addition to the Chargers and most likely if the Chargers don't make the playoffs, they'll have a new system in. So we'll see who fits the system best, but you know, Kool-Aid is pretty much head and shoulders, the number one corner in the class. Uh, Colts going Romo Dunze. It really depends on, you know, who they're going to have on the roster. You know, there you have Josh Downs. You have Michael Pittman Jr. It depends if you're going to re-sign him, which I assume you will because that's what the Colts do. You know, I obviously am a little bit biased towards Alec Pierce, who I really loved there at Cincinnati. Uh, I'm still not fully sold on Romo Dunze either. I keep watching all 22, trying to see more and more of him and I'm still not sold, but I understand he's a really good athlete. And I have, I guess, like, you know, how we all have types, you know, like, oh, my type of girl is a blonde who is, you know, five foot six and athletic build, right? For me, my wide receiver type is going to be the route runner. Like, for me, I love a guy who can change direction on a dime. That's just my thing. That's why I fell in love with Garrett Wilson, for example. Uh, Romo Dunze is not necessarily that. So it explains why I haven't been able to get fully sold on him because, you know, just like when you show me a girl who might be your type, might not be my type. And Romo Dunze is not necessarily my type. So I'm trying my best to see him through the eyes of people who, you know, this is their type of receiver. 
And I do think he'd be a good compliment to what they have. He's a very big, I mean, big body possession receiver with Michael Pittman. He has the speed to be a deep threat and he has the size to be a big body. Uh, definitely. I could see their reasoning. I could see the logic. And then having Anthony Richardson throw the ball to him, like chef's kiss Raiders going JC Latham. Don't disagree. Don't disagree. I mean, I was saying for them to get Darnell Wright last year uh, as my boy Sanjit. He, uh, he's, he and I, that's actually how we first started bonding was talking about Darnell Wright being a beast. Uh, this guy could be not on that level, in my opinion, because I I was really sold on Darnell, but I do think he gets pretty damn close. So next we get the Bills going Cooper to Gene. This is, in my opinion, the best pick you can make for Buffalo because he is unbelievably versatile. And the fact is this team has pretty much a role for him in every single one of those positions where he could be versatile. So he's going to find a role and he's going to succeed in it. And it's a need of the team. So, you know, you're going to be filling something with a high level player. Now, the question is, how would you approach this? It says cornerback for me. I'm not fully sold on him as a corner. I think he's a slot slash safety. And I think he could be a top 10 safety in the NFL. But for me, when I look at Cooper DeGene, if that's my philosophy. If you look at him as a boundary corner, that might encourage the Bills down the board to be drafting positions that might overlap with what Cooper DeGene could do best. That's what worries me a little bit about the designation as a corner. But, you know, it obviously we're all talking about this as a defensive back. Whenever you say corner, it's because he plays corner. That's the simple truth. But he's just so good. Like he handle any role in the secondary. Exactly. But you know, if you think of him as a boundary corner, my only concern is like, hey, if there's a good boundary corner down the board, oh, we already have Cooper DeGene, like we'll pass on that. When in reality, you can have both. You can have your uh, your pie and eat it too, or whatever the hell the phrase is. You cake and eat it too. I think pie. Who knows? Uh, but we have the Cincinnati Bengals going Troy Fautanu here. Let up five pressures this week as a tackle. But the simple fact is right here, he is probably going to be a guard. And that, that for me, if a tackle lets up five pressures in the game, that's pretty much a red flag to me to guarantee him as probably not going to work as a tackle in the NFL. And a couple really, my top two tackles on my board have gotten really damn close to that in Fuaga and, and uh, Fashanyu this year with four pressures each. But, you know, you got to obviously understand why there's more context than anything. But allowing five pressures to me, oh, I guess it's more confirmation bias than anything. But I really do see him in the likes of Elijah Vera Tucker. The question is, do you think the Bengals get the most value out of this pick with Troy Fautanu? Maybe. And the fact is, he can potentially step in at tackle in case of injury. I do like that. And with the tackles that are left on the board, I don't blame you. If you want to go offensive line, this guy's the most versatile besides Graham Barton. And it just really depends on what you want. Troy Fautanu is a beast. I am not against this pick. It just really depends on what you think is your best bang for your buck. You got the Saints going Jordan Morgan here. It's intriguing because I think both tackles are under contract until 2026, but he is, he's been doing better and better, man. I got to give him credit. He started out the year really rocky, like really rocky. He had one game under two pressures to start out the year until his Washington game. After the Washington game, he's allowed three pressures total. And I believe that's in four or five games. So it's good to see him ascend, but you also got to realize he, he's already allowed, I think, 13 pressures this year. And it's not the end of the world, but it was very concentrated at the beginning of the year where he was coming off his ACL tear, which is a good thing that he's getting more comfortable than less comfortable. But, you know, it it just really depends on how comfortable you are with bringing in competition with Trevor Penning. Are you going to call him an absolute bust this early? I was never a fan of him, so, I mean, it is what it is. But Jordan Morgan... He is, he has a ton of upside. He's a very good athlete. Uh, I would not shame the Saints for going after this. I would just say financially, it might be a little bit tough to have essentially three tackles on expensive contracts because, you know, first round contracts are not cheap and you are not going to have two first round contracts. There's just a lot up in the air, especially with the quarterbacks on the board. I don't trust Eric Carr. It is what it is. Cardinals ain't going Jerzon, Johnny Newton. Uh, he's listed as a blue chip player for me. So I mean, I feel like that should explain my opinion on Jerzon Newton, but he is 
the creme de la creme of the interior defensive linemen. This is a solid interior defensive line class. There's going to be dudes down the board in the third round who are quite solid. So, you know, it could end up with Johnny Newton being here if the team see value in the depth players. Like, there's no need to spend a high value pick on a solid value position if you could spend a lower value pick and get somebody of similar value. Like, that's just the general thought process of supply and demand. But Jerzon Newton is incredible. This is a dream pick for the Cardinals. I actually went two interior defensive linemen for him in my last three-round mock because I do think they really, after looking at the roster, they really need to revamp that interior. So not going to be against that at all. Uh, Vikings go Penix. I mean, for me, y'all know how much I love seeing Michael Penix in purple. When the Vikings had a top 10 pick, I would still take Michael Penix there. He looks good in purple. This is a good system for him to maximize. I am not against it whatsoever. Cowboys going Dallas Turner. I don't really feel like they need to go after edge rusher, but this is essentially BPA. For me, I would go after offensive lineman with Graham Barton because if he ends up working as a tackle, he could be the left tackle, but he could also be an elite level center. Both of them are positions you need. So uh, similar to the Cooper DeGene thing, or DeGene thing. Wow, great explanation, Alex. Uh, Similar to the analysis on Cooper DeGene to the Bills where they have the holes open and you're essentially going to allow him to find his best role. That would be where I would lean at this pick. Cornerback as well is a very solid position to go after. You got guys like Kalen King on the board. For me, I would be in the market for that. Terry and Arnold can go back to Bama. So those are where I would go. But, you know, going Dallas Turner, he's my number seven player in the draft. I couldn't get too mad at that at all. He's a really, really good player. Then you got the Steelers going Nate Wiggins. I just don't trust Nate Wiggins versus more physical receivers. I, you know, for me, my first uh, experience with Nate Wiggins was watching him versus Johnny Newton, not Johnny Newton, uh, Johnny Wilson. And he could not handle the size. Now, to be fair, not many people can. So understandably so. But, you know, just naturally it was no competition. And that's the physicality of the AFC North. The one thing I do like is that Nate Wiggins has been really solid versus the run, and that is something the Steelers will be probably looking for. I would obviously pair him up with Kalen King. Again, this is Connor's mock. I can guarantee you this is based on Connor's board. A lot of people have Nate Wiggins as corner two. I think the Steelers can use a corner two. So, uh, you know, this is understandably logical, but deep down inside, I would love to see Kalen King pair back up with Joey Porter Jr. You got the Texans going Troy Franklin. I think he fits a position like he fits a role that is not there right now. The having that bigger deep threat, you have someone who runs four or five is super small and tank Dell, who I absolutely adore, but he should not be the deep threat. A guy who's four or five is not going to separate necessarily with speed. That's that route running separation that I was talking about earlier. And I love it. Troy Franklin is that guy who will take the top off. He also is a really good route runner, but like, so I'm not going to discredit him for that but he really can take the top off of a defense. He'll probably be low four fours, if not high four threes. He put on 10 pounds, so he's actually usable in the NFL as around a 190 pounder. And again, just overall, apart from his drops this year, he's had some pretty weird drops. He could be absolutely incredible. So I'm very excited to see what Troy Franklin could do here with the Texans. You got the Dolphins going Patrick Paul. Like, yeah, I mean, he is statistically incredible. I just don't see it like similar to Trevor Penning, but Trevor Penning was statistically not incredible either. Uh, Patrick Paul is statistically unbelievable. He, he has the size. He has the efficiency. He has what you're looking for in terms of the statistics. I don't see it necessarily. I don't know why I boosted him up a little bit, but like to the fifth round, uh, I'm going to continue watching him, hoping to see something. But so far, I haven't. Uh, through the eyes of the general consensus, this makes total sense. You know, it really does. You're getting a high end, high efficient, highly efficient right ta- or left tackle. So he doesn't have to be a blindside tackle either, but he's going to be essentially the successor there for Taron Armstead. It's good value for somebody who's been that consistent. Well, there you go for the pick number 26, the Seahawks going Tyler Newbin. I do know that y'all have a lot of money. Yeah, there you go. Handle money going with Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams. I think Diggs could be released for a pretty large net uh, savings this pet in this offseason. And if that's the case, dude, Newbin's going to be, he he fits the Seahawk mentality. 
when I look at it, I'm like, I want to take Tyler Newbin to the Seahawks. But unless they get rid of Quandre, it's going to be tough. Because Newbin's a really good value player. And the Seahawks could certainly use that. They're just a team. I would, of course, again, go quarterback here with Bo Nix. But, you know, I again, it's my board versus uh, versus our good old friend Connors here. But it is what it is. Um, Seahawks going Tyler Newbin. If they end up getting rid of one of the safeties, he could be a supreme talent. And I would love it. The Niners then going Terry and Arnold. I made this pick in my past two mock drafts. I am an absolute fan of it. He's just, he's a little too streaky for me to be trusting him as a pure corner one. But if you have Javarius Ward across from him, this guy makes plays. And I'm excited to see what he can do in the NFL as a corner number two. He gets targeted because of the fact that Kool-Aid McKinstry is an absolute monster, but this guy can hold his own as a pure corner two. I don't know if he ends up going back to try to prove himself as a corner one, but if he ends up coming out, this is an A-plus move for the Niners. You got Jacksonville going Graham Barton. You know, Balky loves his athletic offensive lineman. The fact this guy can play anywhere, I'm not going to disagree with it. Now, they did bring in Ezra Cleveland, but I don't know if Ezra was on his last year of his contract. Got to review those contracts. Um, that's something I'm doing currently with most of the rosters, but this could be a very valuable addition. I would go after wide receiver here because I do think they should probably continue um, lifting up the receiving core. Trevor Lawrence just has, the Jaguars just have shit luck. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Graham Barton would be still a very fine addition. The Ravens go on Mecca Abuka. They not like they need more wide receivers, but he'd probably replace Odell Beckham Jr. and that'd be an A plus move. I'm starting to think a Mecca could be similar comp to current Odell with a little bit more juice. Like I do really like it. Maybe a Mecca. He's like OBJ with. I mean, it's just off the top of my head. I could totally see him doing those big OBJ plays that he's made on the Ravens so far. Like it really does kind of match one to one with my uh, mental image of what a Mecca Buko does. But obviously. He was something completely different with the New York Giants. And I love Emeka Abuga with all my heart. He's my number 18 player. Uh, for me, it's like, how many more weapons does Lamar need? Like, it, it really, to me, it doesn't make much sense. They've invested like 50,000 draft picks into weapons for this team. Uh, I'm not going to shame it because, again, OBJ is going to be gone. So there is a vacancy. But as a Steelers fan, it's like, when does it stop? When does it stop? Uh, pick number 30, the Lions go Kamari Laster. They should be looking for a boundary corner. He is on the lighter side, but he is very, very, very tenacious. He is feisty as hell. Uh, obviously one of the best athletes in this class. I think the team needs it. It's a high value position. I would prefer to go after someone like Dwight McLaughlin at this point. Um, you know, Kalen King still on the board, but you know we'll ignore that for the time being. You all know my love for Kalen, but uh, I'm not going to shame this pick if it happens. I wouldn't. Then you got Kansas City Chiefs going 80 Mitchell. I think it's fine. It's a, I mean, it, it fits the profile they're looking for. Bigger body, solid deep threat with good hands. You know, this is going to be a very good compliment to Rashi Rice. So pony up. Shout out to a friend of the show. So there you go. Uh, good job to Kansas City. I think that's a fine pick. I personally would look also at the defense end here with someone like Leonard Taylor on the board, even though he has not played like a first round pick. In pick number 32, the Eagles, and ending off this draft, we got TJ Tampa. I love the shout-out to TJ Tampa. He's been a consistent second-rounder for me, uh, even up into the high second round. I don't know if I'd put him here in the first, but his play wouldn't warrant anything against that. Like He has great frame. He has great production. He's been consistent year after year. Like Genuinely one of the better corners that does not get talked about. I'm so glad he's starting to get the appreciation. Him and Johnny Newton last year, I was like, why is no one talking about these two guys consistently producing and just nobody wanted to talk about them? Now, granted, there's probably some inside information like, yeah, these guys don't want to come out. So maybe that's why. But uh, for a simpleton like myself, I was like, dude, I love these guys. And it's so glad I'm so glad to see it. So, uh, Connor, come on the show, please. But for you, thank you for watching and always feel free to join the community. So thank you for supporting as always. See you on the far side. Peace.